working anymore, is it? Hi, everyone. We are recording now. So thank you for being here and waiting a few minutes. Um, today, we are having here with us Maxim Zimmerman. who is a PhD in neuroscience from the University of Sussex. And he is uh, representing Trend NGO, Trend in Africa, which is an organization we are working with now um, at Shosigo Publicando. Uh, from now on, we will have this and other courses together with them. So welcome all um, Trend students as well. And uh, today's course is Methodology and Open Science, Improving the Research Paradigm. Um, so I hope you enjoy it and welcome again, Maxim. So thanks for having me. Thanks for having me here with you today. Um, as Nicolas said, this, uh, this specific talk is part of a, of a larger series that uh, we're going to cover regarding uh, open science topic. So this is why today um, I'm going to talk about some topics and concepts regarding open science. I will not get into depth in it because it's going to be covered in, uh, in future talks. For, so for this first talk, what I would like to do is actually focus uh, a bit on something that is a bit more general, uh, a bit more abstract, and that is part of every research. No matter what you're doing, no matter what the field of study you are, if you're doing quantitative research, qualitative research, this applies to all of us, and that is, of course, methodology. So uh, what actually is methodology? Why is it crucial that we should pay attention to the robustness of our methodology? How is it important to include those paradigms into our research paradigm? Why should we encourage our students or any stage career or peers to actually consider methodological principles. The thing is that what I would like to is actually encourage you to, uh, to discuss and consider and encourage your peer to actually reflect on your own research. And mostly what we're going to see is how open source practices, open science practices, might improve your research paradigm in a more global way. So, what actually is the research paradigm? The, um, what we might call research, no matter your field, is actually the set of actions that you undertake to try to find a way, in a systematic way, to answer a question you may have about your specific field. You have an observation in nature, you ask yourself a specific question you want to assess. The research is the methodic and systematic way you're going to attempt to find logical links between different experiments you will conduct, try to unravel the, the truth behind an observation. Regarding the paradigm, um, I really like using uh, Thomas Kuhn definition, which is uh, the set of common beliefs and arguments that is shared between scientists of a specific field about how problem, any problem observation within this field should be understood and addressed. But that's what I mean is, um, what is a research paradigm? It's literally a conventional model. It's a convention that um, is a set of ideas, of, of belief, of an understanding in one field within which the theories and the practice can function. And out of this research paradigm, we can ask ourselves two questions. What is there to know? What is there to study? And how can we actually know about it? Those seems rather... Um, philosophical question and you are fully right because they are and i can only concur with uh, gundola bosch on this let's put philosophy back into the doctorate of philosophy that is definition of phd by the way in this um very short article that you can find on nature that was published a couple of years back five years already um, she detailed uh, the struggle she had to actually implement a couple of courses within her institution regarding uh, methodology and regarding critical thinking courses. Because it is actually true that very few education institutions provide or offer courses on methodology or any kind of critical thinking regarding research. 
meaning that most of the time due to logistic or due to budgetary constraint, we offer uh, students in those institutions, we offer them courses related to the specific field of studies. We train them to be very good specialists within their own field, which, which is good, of course. The point is we teach them what to do in science, what to do in research, but we do not we do not teach them how to do research, how to reflect about their own research, about what there is to know into their own field. Problem is, you expect from uh, a colleague, from a researcher, a scientist, you expect them to have some sense of critical thinking. That's what you expect from them. If they review something for the literature, you expect them to be critical about it, to take what is for granted, to assess the quality of the study. But it's something you expect us to be inherent from the title of scientists, but it's not something we actually teach. We expect that it will come out of nowhere. We have very good feedback from this kind of courses in education where actually students enjoy it and find it very interesting to reflect about their own methodology, about their own research. Thing that is very hard to implement, it's uh, usually colleagues who would like their own PhD to focus their time on a specific set of skills. I will concur with Gundula here that it's, it's a mistake. So today, let's talk about uh, methodology itself. Methodology is a very extended topic, so I'm not going to go into depth here. I'm just going to give you uh, a quick overview so we can uh, move forward and we all have the same definition about what we're actually talking about. But um, I really encourage, um, especially our younger colleagues here, to actually document themselves about these specific topics. There's a lot to gain and a lot to reflect upon what you consider to be uh, the proper set of ruling in which you do uh, your research. So research paradigm, what is it? Uh, usually when um, with newcomers, with students, we use a metaphor and the metaphor you we're using is the iceberg. It's a very nice, uh, I really like this one because a nice feature of the iceberg is that you can only see about 10% of its total volume. Only 10% of it emerge above the waters, and that's mostly what you see. If we use that as a metaphor for the research paradigm, the tip of the iceberg will be the methods part. And way too often, methods are mistaken with methodology. The method is the visible bit of your research. Methods actually uh, consist of the techniques you use to collect your data, and any analysis technique, code, statistic test, you may run to actually uh, display your data. That is uh, the bit you will find in a paper under the method section. If I were to do an analogy, if, for example, your point in research is to make a pie, let's say, a lemon pie, not to make a pie, no matter what uh, platform, whatever media you use to transmit your pie, the method will be your recipe. You use two eggs, you use this type of flour, you use that amount of sugar. So if someone wants to reproduce your pie or your research in that case, they will have to follow through your recipe, your methods. Thing is, you can not expect them from following these uh, methods to end up with a similar result, to end up with a similar pie. You will never get the same pie, but you will get at least a similar output. Point is, does that give you any sense about what you are applying these methods? Does that give you any indication about what is this pie? Actually, no. If you look uh, at the iceberg, you will see that there's more to it than just a tip. You will see there's some big chunk just below the water. You have a glimpse of it in a murky water. That's what we will call methodology. Methodology, it's literally the study of methods. It's the set of debate, discussion, conversations that you have about how you should run your research why you chose these methods over another. Why did you choose to take this particular bit over another? Why you design it into that order? Why didn't you exclude this part? It might be for logistic reasons, maybe for budgetary time constraint. This is where you design it. Methodology is always there. Technically, in a paper, it would be more or less implied more or less properly, we're going to talk about that later. But you can get a sense through the writing why the author chose these methods. It's, uh, so it's a bit that is always there. And of course, depending on the field you are, 
The methodology will differ depending on your goal you have. If your point of doing research is to come up with new knowledge, depending on the field of study you are, the methodology will differ. Methodology is actually deeply linked to the scientific methods. It is linked to it in a sense that it is expected through your methodology that you understand or you know the state of the art of your own particular research field. Therefore, you decide to build on it. You decide to use this methodology based on this knowledge, the consensual knowledge that we have about one field. If you were to resume uh, very quickly what methodology is about, methodology is the systematic search for error. More or less, we describe the scientific method. The point is that through methodology, you describe that I chose this set of action to avoid this error from arising to avoid any kind of variable to come, you want to consider experimental and experimental biases. You want to at least be aware that they're here and that you take action to control it. When we actually talk about uh, experimental bias, usually I like to interact uh, um, with people, with students, with colleagues. We talk uh, about the discussion, about, uh, about the research, about the method, the methodology. Uh, here we don't have time, so I'm just going to take a quick example that I find uh, very striking because most people relate to that. Uh, one bias example you can find uh, that is very common in publication, it's what we call the survivorship bias. It's a type of sampling bias that, I mean, the origin is very funny, but let's say not funny, it's uh, interesting because the origin story starts with the Second World War, that's a not funny. Point is, um, back at the time when the British planes were bombing Germany, there were a lot of laws. And the thing is, at that point, they were trying to reduce the amount of casualties they, they get. They wanted to save material, personal. So they wanted to reinforce uh, armor from the planes. Thing is that if you reinforce it everywhere, of course, you're going to have a very heavy plane. You cannot take off or you cannot. You're going to use too much fuel, whatever. So you want to actually make it uh, efficient. So what they did is that um, they look at the planes that came back and actually all the dots that you see here, they bullet impact. Their position of all impact. So obviously what they did is that they put extra plating over those areas. Okay, great. It doesn't work. It didn't work for a simple reason is that that's absolutely not the way to go. The casualty ratio was the same. It was even worse because now the plane were heavier. Then came this guy, an exile from Hungary, and he taught the Brits a bit of statistics and explained to them that they were conducting a sample bias here because they were only examining the plane that actually came back, meaning they were ignoring in the data, in the way they're collecting the data, they were ignoring all the planes that did not. So the point is, instead, of covering all those areas. Because technically, if you can assess the hole in this plane that came back, it means that you can actually fly, come back home with this hole in. So the part of the plane you should actually reinforce are these. Here you have a very simple example that people can actually relate to about what the survivorship bias is about. You will find the same kind of bias for example, in biomedical companies where they use subjective perspective. If you have uh, medicine staff, for example, uh, they give some kind of treatment and for them, due to the experiment, from the point of view, this treatment works and people are very happy and they keep coming back. But in the subjective point of view, what they forget is all the patients that does not come back. Maybe they die, maybe they got tired of treatment that doesn't work. Point is that they do not include it in their analysis, might be subjective or objective. You will find that the survivorship bias is present in many, many publications. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that, just a quick example to see what I'm talking about when I'm talking about methodology and uh, trying to systematically find errors in your protocol. I'm talking about this kind of experimental bias. There's hundreds of them. They're all very funny to go through at some point we can come up with a dictative game with the students when we talk about methodology. But um, for the time being, let's just move forward. So we have the method, we have the methodology, and you can see that you know that there's more to it. The iceberg actually goes deeper, but there's something you, can't, you cannot see, but it's always there. And that is what we call epistemology. Epistemology comes from epistem, which is to know 
in ancient Greek. It's literally the theory of knowledge. It's a set of discussion you will have within your field about what is knowable and what is worth knowing. It's technically what are the steps you're supposed to take to gain knowledge about something within your field. And once again, it is always there. May you be aware of it or not. Epistemology, it's um, the literal study that allows you to make the distinction between a set of belief and a set of knowledge. Usually the common examples that we get it's, uh, with students is uh, you can make fun all you want uh, about flat earther, for example. Point is, how do you know that Earth is round? Or donut shape, or triangular, I don't really care. What will be your argumentation about saying that I do note that to be a knowledge is that Earth is round? It's actually a very trick to do to yourself to actually try to come up and not use arguments that you will neglect or refute to someone who thinks it's in the shape of a donut. Plato already made this distinction between episteme and doxa. Doxa in this term means what is a common sense. If you agree that Earth is round just because it's a popular belief, because everybody knows that, of course, it is round, therefore you're not producing knowledge. You're not asserting that this particular fact can be conceptualized as knowledge. And what I want to bring here is that any view, any perspe perspective between um, the theory and the practice implies an epistemological position. If we go back to our little analogy of the pie, it's um, how do you know, for example, that if I beat the eggs a lot, I will end up with meringue. It's not about what are the steps to be taken to test if it works, it's how do I know for a fact factually that if I beat the eggs, I will end up with something different. If I eat it for two hours, that will happen, I don't know, in a molecular structure, for example. In uh, science, when we talk about epistemology, mostly we think about one guy. There's one name that pops in our mind. And that's Karl Popper. And there's many um, science philosophers around through the ages, from David Hume to uh, Bachelor or Russell, there's many names, there are many paradigms, just to let you know that it's still a dynamic thing, it's still something that is debated today, but somehow when we talk about science and philosophy and epistemology, we think about Karl Popper. So let's just take him as an example about what epistemology might be about. Um, Karl Popper, for example, in his, uh, in his work, The Logic Scientific Discovery, uh, he made a clear distinction about what he considered to be science and pseudoscience. And he's using an uh, example at his time, which is technically uh, Einstein's theory versus uh, Freud theory, where well, he distinguished one to be science and the other one pseudoscience. And in his stance, he, he demonstrates that a theory can only be robust if it is falsifiable, meaning that if you can refute a theory, therefore it stands. Meaning that if you have an argumentation that is not refutable, it's not that it's not right, it's that it's not even wrong, it's a dead end. If you take, for example, um, a very robust theory, if we take, for example, the, the theory of evolution, it is strong because it is refutable. I can easily refute the theory of evolution. I, for example, uh, I can tell you to go out there and find a geological layer that comprises many fossils, and those fossils are from different geological era. Easy. Well, try to find it first. Good luck with that. Point is, you can actually come up with a demonstration, with an argumentation that will uh, refute the theory. Something that is not refutable cannot be considered as part of knowledge. That is what I want to make here. There's a lot to do here. There's a lot to, uh, to consider. But once again, I really encourage you to. Um, to document yourself about, about these topics that are important to research, there are debates you want to have within your own field. It's uh, within your own philosophy, you want actually to reflect about what there is to know and how you can actually gain knowledge out of the research protocol you have been designed. Then there's the last bit of the iceberg, onto which 
uh, everything stands for. Once again, this iceberg thing, it's a big chunk. You cannot take one thing apart. Everything stands together, might you be aware of it or not. The last part is ontology. Ontology, it's literally is a study of what it is to be. It's, um, from what I understand in a crowd, um, in the audience today is as a bit uh, diverse crowd, but um, I guess that you are mostly all um, natural science researcher. Ontology will come very handy in qualitative research, for example, in social sciences, where what you define as a reality will differ in time, in concept, in individuals. So that's actually something you want to, to explore. If we go back to our pie analogy, ontology will be um, what is a pie? What you consider to be a pie? Is it a shape? Is it a taste? It was made of? If I cut a piece of it, is that still a pie? If it doesn't have the shape of a pie, if it's square? Here, if you want to describe, if you want to um, build up a methodology about your, in your particular field of interest, in your particular field of study, you need to have an ontological stance. You need to know what there is to be, and therefore you can gain knowledge out of it, therefore build a methodology to actually explore this field towards the question you're asking within this field. I know that's clear, but um, there is a research paradigm for you. So like I said, it's a very extended topic. This is just a very quick uh, overlook, so we can move forward. Usually what I like to do, I like to uh, to exchange with, uh, with people about their research, or usually we take a case study. So understand that uh, we have mostly biologists in a room today, so I'm going to take uh, something you will all uh, like to cover as a case study. I will take an economic paper that doesn't want to show up. Here it is. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I guess you didn't see that coming. So uh, this particular paper was published in 2010 and it was written, uh, the author um, are Ryan Art and Rogoff. They are very two prominent names in the field of economics. They are Harvard professors and they published this article in one of the best uh, review in the field, the American Economic Review. It's very easy to read, it's four, four or five pages long, but the main point here in, uh, in this paper it's if you look at uh, economical data in different countries over the last 60, 70 years, what you've noticed is that um, when you have a public debt that is expressed in percentage of GDP, if you have it exceeding a certain threshold, here 90%, when you have uh, your public debt passing the threshold of 90% of your GDP, therefore you do not have economic growth at all. Actually, your country enter a recession state, you have a collapse in your economies and the purge arise, and all the secondary effect you can think about. Pretty scary, isn't it? So point is, at the time, this paper was used and referred to in many political and economical decisions, might be in the US or in the EU, and actually most uh, austerity, austerity policy were taken with the question of this particular article and all of those that followed. So just to be clear, I'm not claiming, I'm not saying that uh, politics act op upon austerity measures following this article. I'm saying that they use that as a caution to justify their austerity policy. For example, putting Greece under a uh, strict economic measurement. If I'm showing you this, uh, you, I guess you expect me to show you that the methodology is flawed. Yeah, it is. Point is, uh, it was uh, out there for years, and at some point, at some point, you had um, a master student at the University of Massachusetts that was giving an assignment. Stupid assignment was just you take whatever economical paper you want, you read the review, and you try to reproduce the result. Yeah, st standard assignment. Thing is that he could not. He went to his professors and said, "Sorry, I cannot do that." Come on, the data is open source. You can actually collect the data and do it yourself. Impossible to do it. If you cannot reproduce, what does that mean? That means that no matter the fact that the data is available, the method that was provided is in the article was not good enough to reproduce the, um, that as a paper result. That's already a big problem. Therefore, the professor contacted those big other names and asked about their methodology. 
And the only thing they receive is an Excel file because yes, the data was compiled in an Excel spreadsheet. Point is, something I should have mentioned, uh, the data only come from 20 countries. Talk about that a bit later. The data was compiled, like I said, on Excel spreadsheet. The data was pondered for some years, meaning that uh, within the analysis, they decided that, for example, uh, I don't know, Portugal, Spain, in 52, uh, this year was uh, ponderated. It was giving more weight. I don't know. Meaning that in their methodology, they didn't argue or discuss why they were giving more importance to this particular set of data. Maybe, I don't know, it was a very sunny year and Portugal exported a lot of wine, therefore there was a big growth due to that. If you ponder your data, you have to explain it, you have to define it, you have to justify it. Yeah, there was no such things. Then there were data exclusion for some countries. For Norway, for example, a big decade was chunked out. Was it because of a lack of data? Was it because we don't know because they don't detail it? Once again, it was very obscure. You do not know how they end up with a result. But the very funny part, I mean, funny, uh, remember that this paper had consequences, is that the data was not compiled for the country starting from A to D, meaning Australia, Austria, Belgium, Canada, Denmark. So all very rich countries were taken out of these equations. So the funny thing is that um, the hypothesis here is that they formulated because they were using Excel, don't ask me why, but technically what they did, uh, what we expect that they wrote the formula on the first line and they just spread it all across the sheets but didn't include, or maybe they released a mouse click, I don't know. Meaning they just didn't check the data before publishing and just ignoring those file rows here. That's some kind of a problem, isn't it? When they redid, uh, in my session, when they redid the study, this is what they found is that if we take the data correctly, if we ponder it correctly, you, yes, you do have a correlation between public depth and gross rate. Yeah, it's uh, economy, it's a multifactorial variables. You expect to have some kind of correlation, but methodology will detect you that correlation is not causation, never co coincidences. So even if you have a slow gross rate following this uh, threshold of 90%, you don't enter a recession. So the thing is, you have many things to consider here. The method was flawed. Methodology was not properly explained. And I will go even further, is that in this article, they only use average and median data. There's no proper statistical test. Point is, the epistemology also is flawed. If you want to gain knowledge about if you want to find if there's a correlation, if that's a question to start with, a correlation between growth rate and um, public debt, is a way to go to gain knowledge about this to compute random average and median from 20 countries. I'm not an economist, but I will, I'm tempted to say no. How did that happen? Because at some point uh, when uh, the scandal arose, when it was uh, put into the light, we consider that, uh, they consider that this paper did not meet the standards for this particular journal. How did that happen? Well, the answer is that it didn't meet, it wasn't peer-reviewed at all. So even if peer-reviewed as is a uh, defect, even if peer-reviewed, and we can talk about that on the open science part, even if peer review is not perfect, at least you have some bit of reviewing. This, in this case, the journal trusted those two big names. Point is that you had a big argument of authority that those two big names in economic cannot be wrong, cannot make mistakes, and therefore there was no point of peer-reviewing it. My problem with uh, this paper is that it's still ongoing. It has been quoted over 5,000 times, and you see it has been steadily been quoted up until 2023, even it has been, let's say, debunked to be simple. We all have examples like that. So if you hear someone telling you, or a student telling you, why should I care about methodology? I'm just doing that, I know what I'm doing, it's I'm pushing a button, I have the result, there it is, you have two stars, it's statistically significant. If you do not have robust uh, methodology, you can end up with misconduct, with fraud, with uh, badly collected data, with misinterpretations that can have actual consequences into the real world. You might think that who cares because I'm working on a on a stupid molecule in a cell that nobody cares about. Why should I actually care? 
is actually about uh, bringing the methodology further. If you can actually discuss about your methodology, about if you can review methodology of other, you can actually improve your own research paradigm. You can actually gain uh, knowledge about uh, the state of the art in your own field. And therefore, you can act upon it to avoid this kind of uh, misdirection. I mean, we like to have a couple of uh, examples, but I'm just going to skip it from now on. So how does that relate to, um, to today's topic? How open science can actually help us to improve this kind of paradigm? Not working anymore. So what is open science? Uh, once again, this is only the first talk of a series on open science. You're going to have dedicated talk about all the, uh, the aspects of open sciences. If you go to the UNESCO definition, open science is a global movement that makes any kind of scientific research. It might mean the data collection, the, uh, the impact, the political choice about where put the found towards this or this research. It's to make it uh, accessible to all levels of societies. It doesn't matter if you're a student, if you're a scientist, if you're an amateur, if you're a grandest, it doesn't matter. The point of open science is to make all kinds of knowledge transparent. It's only through transparency that you can actually improve the quality of data, the quality of knowledge that you disseminate within your society. Keep in mind the example from the paper above. Their methods were as not transparent. Their methodology was absolutely not transparent. And the epistemology was flawed. But point is, transparency here is a warranty of having a good discussion, at least, about why we employ this methodology over another to actually answer a specific question within one field. UNESCO actually uh, described different elements of open science. And in the last meeting there, um, I mean, two years ago already, uh, they described different principles in open science. The first one being open methodology. Yeah, like it. So the point is, when you publish your data, you are encouraged to actually publish alongside a documentation about your methodology, the reasoning behind which you undertake this particular type of experiment, what you're trying to demonstrate. If you have access in your field to the methodology of your peers, you can actually understand how they came to generate this particular type of data. You can actually assess and critically think about the relevancy of using these particular methods to obtain this kind of data. And therefore, you can build on it. You can bring your own methodology. Most of the time, you will have um, journals, reviews, that will refuse some papers because their methods do not fit to the golden standard. And the point is that at some point, they fail to understand that the golden standard is not something that is uh, right or absolute by definition. If you share your methodology, you actually share the logical link that helps you to generate such data and actually justify their relevancy, no matter if you're using this type of method or another. The open methodology is um, highly linked to another principle, which is open source. So most of you know open source software. So when we talk about open source software, we think about uh, GNU, Linux. If you're working with code, uh, you can think about Python, for example. Python, which is a programming language, which is free and open source. I mean, you can use it, you can have access to the source code, and you can play with that. I will always encourage you, if you're doing any kind of analysis, I will always encourage you to use Python. I'm not going to enter the debate which, uh, which programming language is the best, but let's say that if you collect your data in a very methodic fashion, in a very systematic fashion, but all your code is being run by an obscure paywall uh, language, like, I don't know, Igor Pro, sorry, Tom, this doesn't help to make your case because if you collect your data and you show your result and you say this happens because I'm using this code but nobody can read it or they need to pay a license to actually access and open your data, therefore we have an issue. You are not transparent anymore. If you like to use MATLAB, for example, so MATLAB is a very popular programming language, but it's not free. 
meaning that you will have many institutions in frugal labs in developing countries that will not have access to those kind of licenses. They will not waste uh, the little money they have on a programming license. So you can use whatever you want, but when you share your methodology, you actually share the reasoning be behind the code. If you say, I'm doing this statistical, st this statistical test, I'm using this type of data that I'm average over this, and you explain the reasoning, it means technically that anybody can translate your code into their favorite programming language. So it comes hands to hands. It will be always better if you share codes using open source software like Python. I will do it. Another um, open source software that is highly popular is Arduino. Arduino is open source. Arduino allows you to control uh, microcontrollers. You can talk, you can do uh, analysis on C++ with this. And Arduino is highly correlated with open source hardware. Open source hardware, you're going to have a full course about open source hardware, but just wait, you know, open source hardware main uh, goal is to share the blueprint of any kind of device you design to your in your experiment, in your methods. The point is to get rid of any black box in your experiment. Most of the time in a lab, you'll have a machine, you have a device, nobody really knows how it works. You just put your data as an input and you have an output. Let's say it's a red light or a green light, let's say. Point is that you trust the outcome of your data within a black box that you cannot access that if it fails, you cannot repair. And most of the time, you do not know what happens. Open source hardware is designed to actually leverage this, to actually be able to understand what's going on between um, within the machine you're actually using. Most of the time, when you're doing research, you are so specific in your field that you want to develop a device, a machine, a stimulator, whatever you want, that is dedicated to your research. That in sense, is a part of R&D, that's part of research. But if you do not share the blueprint of the device you conceive to actually answer a specific question, your data is not reproducible. If you share this, or if you use the blueprint that someone else shared, you can actually build upon it. You can critical it. You can uh, build on it. You can improve it. You can come up with a standardized open source uh, system that will help your entire field to move forward into his discovery of knowledge. Anyway, um, but you will have a full uh, full lecture on open source hardware. I hope so. Been. Then you have open data. So open data, we all know about it. Uh, you have uh, you are really encouraged to when you publish uh, any experiment, any research that you may have. You are highly encouraged to share your data alongside. It is a poor value if you do an experiment, if you do a publication, you write about it, you share a perfect methodology, but you do not share the data that go alongside it. Meaning that if I want to reproduce your data, or if I have something similar and I want to use your methodology, if I cannot check if it works on yours, there is absolutely no point. I'm supposed to take your words for it. You have many platforms that exist to share your data. Once again, we'll call that later, but one that I particularly like is uh, Zenodo. So Zenodo is very interesting. It's a server where you can actually share your data, where you can link it to a publication. You can actually lock it to prevent any uh, modification of the data afterwards. That will prevent a bit of fraud. Uh, you can timestamp it. You can actually link it to your DOI. So Zenodo is a very interesting platform to share a large bit of data. But you are encouraged in this open science principle to share any bit of data you're using and not just your conclusion. Anybody should be able to use your data, reproduce it, and check if it's coherent. Then it is highly linked to what we call open access. So you're going to have a full lectures on uh, open publication, but open access is, uh, is a belief that all scientific knowledge, all scientific findings, should be freely accessible by anyone. It means that you do not have to go through a paywall to actually have access to a universal knowledge, some things that has been designed by your peers, that has been paid already by the public, and you have to pay more. You're going to have a full talk about that. When you talk about open access, we can only encourage you to put your writing, your first manuscript, on preprint servers. Most people think that preprints are just uh, a bad type of publication because they're not peer-reviewed, because they've just been 
under review, nothing can be more wrong when you have a preprint server like BioArchive, like Archive, like African Archive. When you have zoos, you can actually timestamp it, meaning that if you're afraid that someone's going to double cross you, you can actually have a time. No, I've produced that first. If you're afraid that it will have less value, you can actually use a DOI of a specific uh, preprint before your official publication in a more prestigious journal. If you put that on a preprint server, you're actually inviting your entire community, your entire field to read it, to understand it, to have access to it, maybe built early on on it to improve your knowledge on this field, but mostly they will be encouraged to leave comments, meaning that it's an open, uh, open call for participation for the review. That will help you overall to, in your fin final publication in the official journal, that will help you to have a better publication. If there's some mistakes, some, some typos, some errors, or if you forgot that, or maybe you were suggested a particular experiment to actually improve the quality of your publication, then preprint will be the way to go. Because uh, we can talk about that just after, but uh, open publica publication in general does not allow you to actually discuss properly with the people in your field to actually improve your publication. And open access is actually a big issue and, and uh, no comment. Yeah. Let's move on. Uh, the fifth principle is open peer review. So open peer review is a belief that uh, any, any publication should have some form of transparency. And it relies on three uh, very simple principles. The first one is open identity. The open science principles encourage you to actually reveal your identity when you review a paper. In that case, it is supposed to uh, alleviate any kind of bullying or harassment you may encounter in the process of reviewing. It might also alleviate any kind of conflict, conflict of interest you may have between one reviewer and one author or one editor. Having this kind of open identity is also supposed to help any, any reader of your data, of your publication, to actually assess the qualification of the reviewer to actually assess the quality of your paper. That also goes with uh, the second principle, which is open reports. You have a journal that actually does that uh, quite efficiently, it's eLife. eLife actually um, allows you to reveal your identity, and even better, it allows you to link your ORCID number to your review. So for those who don't know, the ORCID numbers, I really encourage all of you to have one. Uh, the ORCID number is your science number. It's your social science number. It's your identification. So you can link that through eLife. And eLife shared all the review exchange between the author, the editor, and the reviewers. So when you assess a paper, you can actually have access to the round of reviews. You can see if the reviewers actually point out to something you may ask spot as being dodgy or weird in your publication. You can see the original submission. You can see the modifications that happened. Most of the time, people consider that, all people, we consider that if something is peer reviewed, it is done, it is static, it will not move, knowledge is not dynamic, and there's no reason to actually question a paper as soon as it has been published. And it's also a problem because we have seen it's very hard to get something retracted, even if it should. The open um, peer review has a third principle, which is open participation. I don't know how they encourage that to... Uh, that would be a nightmare for an editor to organize. But if you consider a preprint, anybody within a field is allowed to express uh, concern or express any kind of comments for one publication. Overall, and that will create some fight, obviously, that will create some conflict. But like Popper said, scientific research is the friendly, hostile cooperation between scientists. We need debate to actually assess the quality of a specific scientific findings. Having open participation allows you to actually comment, 
to build upon something that has been done that maybe has been used in a, in a field as a consensus where it should not be. If, if you want, there's a very uh, nice website which is called PubPeer. If you go to PubPeer, see, like I said, uh, knowledge is dynamic. So in PubPe, you can actually engage uh, authors about previously published paper. You can actually point out something that went wrong, some methodological errors, some misconduct. If you want to have a very nice uh, morning coffee routine, I can only suggest you to read Elizabeth Bick's work. She's a science uh, fraud expert in the Netherlands, she uh, she works a lot on papier and she actually identified a lot of fraud. So having uh, having the possibility to actually participate to the review part, even once something has been published, is very important for us to actually improve on our methodology. If we consider that, uh, yeah, anyway, if methodology is flawed, we can actually build on it. So let's, uh, I'm running short on time. Um, the last principle is um, open education resources. We're going to talk about that later during the open source hardware part. It's technically the belief that all education resources should be available, might be theoretical, might be, um, might be practical, maybe in sense of equipment. Overall, if you have something to remember is that open science rely on one big topic, which is transparency. It's only through transparency that you can uh, share your methodology, assess the methodology of your peer, find flows in the, in the literature, and actually build up your research based on that. So actually, uh, adopting open science principles allows you to question the literature, to question your own methodological research. And I will finish with that is trust the science is the most anti-science statement ever. Questioning science is how you do science. Only better science correct science. And I will finish by saying that what makes us scientists? It's not a set of skills. You are, we all have our set of skills. Is that the technician part of our, of our title? It's not the amount of knowledge we have. We can gain knowledge, knowledge is dynamic. What makes us scientists, if not the methodology we employ to actually assess if something is true or not? Is the method we use or we choose to use for accepting something as a knowledge? So with that, uh, I will finish here. Uh, thank you for your time. If you have any question or if you would like to discuss any part of the research paradigm, Please go ahead. Yes, Elizabeth Dick. Hello, hello. Gosh, I put all of you in sleep. Thank you, Maxime. If anyone has any questions, you can Write them on the chat box, please. Yeah, it's a boring topic, I know. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. It's actually, I'm um, actually hoping when I have this kind of discussion with colleagues and with students, uh, the goal mostly is to force people to reflect about what they consider as true or as to be the norm. The point as a scientist is mostly to refuse any kind of argument of authority. If you know something, you're supposed to explain how you know it. And there's no problem in to asking someone, how do you know that? Otherwise, it's just a claim, and that's not an episteme. It's a doxa. Thank you, Brado. I don't know if there's some people from train. For example, here, I would like to discuss some research. Ah. What suggestion would you make for early career researchers wanting to challenge authority in the lab? And that's actually a tricky one. 
because we all know what it is when you're just a PhD and you're working under a big authority. We know how difficult it can be to actually challenge those people. Um, in my personal experience, I just ignore it. Please don't tell my PI. Point is, um, you, we know that in open science principle, we work against um, a big chunk. We work against a big lad, which is uh, the publication services, which is a publish or perish principle with the universities to, to get tenures or to get academic position. We can only lead by example. We can only change from within by adopting those principles and forcing it in a way. It's it's one thing to uh, agree to a superior to uh, to follow up on a protocol that you disagree with. It's another to communicate and actually work on it. What I will say is just being aware to start with, with the flow and the methodology is already a big start. You might be in this lab for a while, you won't be there forever. You will know what it is to reproduce, what it is not to reproduce. We work in open sciences, we work bit by bit. Most of the time, the critic we receive is that, why are you doing that? Is it worth it? You're not going to lose. That's the state of the world how it is. You're not going to change it. There's some truth in it. But what's the worst of fighting if you cannot lose? I mean, there's a saying, I cannot translate that. Um, uh, the thing I would like to translate, but it's translatable, sorry. Uh, to fight without peril, you triumph without glory. Yeah, it doesn't have the same ring. But point is that it's not because it's a pointless fight that is not worth to have it. And actually, at some point, you lead by example. The paper I was sharing at the beginning, Gunnar Bosch, the, actually, the article is a description of the fight she had to go with her institution, with her colleagues, to actually implement those methodological uh, classes. And now it has become standard at the Opskin, uh, Ops, Opskin at, at her institute. So that's what I would like to say. Communicate, talk with your peers, make your point, don't accept uh, Alfbeck argument. I know it's tedious. I know it's long. I know sometimes it's a, it's a lost battle. It doesn't mean it's not worth fighting. What part of a paper do you often look at to tell methodology? Ooh. That's actually a good one. When you write a paper, you cannot mostly say anything about the methodology until you read it through. Luckily, what I do is the first thing I look at the title, then quickly the abstract is the title interests me, then is the abstract interests me. I look at the figures and I consider, uh, will I waste time with reading? Waste time, sorry. Will I investigate into reading it? Then, yeah, through the reading, only through the reading, you can see and check if a proper methodology is applied. And only then you go to the method to see how they implement the methodology through the methods. There's no real way to say, uh, is the methodology correct? You have to read it. You have to properly read it. And if you can, depending on what type of study you're doing, try to actually reproduce it or see if it makes sense if you know the state of the art of this particular field. If it's your own field, it's supposed to make sense. But um, most of the time, if you go to eLife, for example, I really like eLife because you can see all the review uh, rounds for a specific publication. I have this colleague, he, uh, he published in eLife. There were something like six or seven rounds of reviews uh, because his paper was about uh, designing, describing a new way to quantify, let's say, X. Problem is that one of the reviewers was a very, I think he has to retired, but he's a very old fashioned uh, person. We don't know who that is, except for identity. And um, he was, stubborn about this is not the way you do it, you're supposed to do it this way. Even if the entire purpose of the paper is to show, is to demonstrate that the golden standard, that the reference methodology was not correct. At some point he lost it and it's very funny to, to read the, the round, he told the editor it was not his role to teach basic physics to the reviewer. But you can have this kind of misconduct in the reviewing process. Therefore, it is important to see what the reviewer asks. So methodology is something that you actually discuss. You cannot actually engage that in a paper if it's not properly described. Like I said, it's just below the surface. 
it's murky in the water, you can get a glimpse at it. If you want to investigate into a methodology on a paper you actually care about, or you find interesting, engage yourself with the author. There are scientists like you, there are your peers, there are your colleagues, they will be more than happy to discuss the paper with you. Maybe they will start a collaboration. Maybe people are happy to talk about that work. They're happy to talk about what worked, what didn't work, and why they choose this over another. So do not hesitate to contact your peers. Don't wait for conferences. Do you consider it appropriate to cite the methodological errors that you observe in articles by other scientists who research you in the same field, uh, but for which you do not have open data, do not cite your observation? Not sure I got this one. To cite, you mean to cite in your in future work? If you're talking about, yeah, okay. If you consider that uh, you found something uh, weird in a paper, you have platform for that. PubPeer is one of them. You can raise question or you can don't be an ass and go straight to the author. Like I said, like Popo said, scientific research is a friendly, hostile cooperation between scientists. We can friendly and uh, benevolently contact people and ask about it. If you find something wrong, those people stand their ground. Your purpose is not to uh, destroy the paper. That's not how it works. If they're in a very same field as you, working in the same model, or I don't know, let's say they're the people next door, they're your main competitors, let's say, your task will be to design a similar uh, protocol or try to reproduce and publish your findings. That's also a problem we have in science. We do not publish negative results. Most of the time, for example, even myself, I've been told not to advertise or publish failure, which is insane, as that's part of methodology. If your methodology, I chose this over this because I tried this for five years, this doesn't work, that's an important bit of information. We should publish about it. So if you find something dodgy that you think is wrong, try to reproduce, publish about your reproduction. Nobody wants a pure reproduction, so try to find an innovative approach or just a reflection about this methodology. Point is, you do not prove something wrong, you fail to reproduce it. That would be the way to go. When you actually, if you go back to what I said about Popper, for example, um, the point is that when you try to, um, you do not confirm a theory, uh, a scientific theory, you do not confirm it. When you bring more knowledge about the theory of evolution, for example, or I don't know, the Einstein theory, we do not say that we once again prove Einstein was right. No, we fail once again to prove him wrong. I don't know if you, know this, if you notice a difference. It's not about semantics. It's really about conceptualize thing. Yeah. So I know it's serious. I know it's long. But if you're in the same field, the point would be to reproduce one uh, data or incorporate their methods, their methodology into your data, see if it works. And if it doesn't work, then you have a nice discussion. That is as interesting as if it was working. A negative result is still a result. And there is also your chance to bring a, hey, this doesn't work, this works better, we try this another collaboration, new standard. Knowledge is dynamic. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Ah, well, how does pub peer work? Well, just go onto it, log on it. But you will see that uh, there's actually a bit of community uh, working there, it's organized by groups. They're actually always looking for specialists in a specific field to help them to identify fraud. But the way Papi works most of the time is that uh, it's articles that are already, I can say, uh, that are suspicious to, uh, of misconduct, I must say, put there. It's, uh, it's already a bit goal orientated. But uh, it is self explanatory, actually, Papier. It's, uh, but like I said, if you want to start getting a glimpse of what actually works, 
uh, Elizabeth Bick. Just read her work. It's uh, she's been awarded recently by uh, what was it by Nature? Andre, you remember? Say that again. Elizabeth Bick actually received recently, uh, it was this year, the Nature Award for uh, scientific know, ethics. Or, yeah. So do follow our work, uh, and you will get a sense of how Pierre can work or what contribution you can make. And you see, at some time, the, they don't even put effort into uh, fraud. It's, uh, it's highly disappointing, to be honest. Here we do we have follow-up questions? All right, so I hope to see you in the next talk. Hola. Okay, if you ah, here it is. Another question. How do you detect and avoid anti-science access collaborator? I'm not sure to understand what you mean by that. <laughs> and you know, you're more than welcome to, uh, to activate your mic if you want to discuss this. Uh, how do you detect and avoid anti-open science collaborators? Well, first you will have to pay for it, I guess. Anti-open access. Anti-open access collaborators. So I think the question is more about how do you, you start a project together with someone and they are not willing to have open access publications, right? Or preprint stuff. <laughs> oh, like how do sense. you avoid that or how do you? When you uh, cannot avoid that, but you can remind them that data is not proprietary. It's not a property. Some data can fall into some embargo depending on your institution. But mostly, uh, anytime you start a collaboration uh, in a contract that is signed by the two institutions, you will have a clause that stipulates who the data belongs to. But um, detecting them and avoiding them, I'm not going to encourage you to leak data, but um, <laughs> data gets stolen, I guess. The point is, uh, you mostly have to understand as a benefit for um, open science and open access. If someone technically we all uh, dot it with reason, usually, uh, anyone can see the benefit of uh, doing open science. I was in a, an institute that uh, didn't care about open science and open access, but kept using open accessible uh, data and technologies. Thing is that at some point they were hurting themselves by not understanding how they can benefit themselves. When we talked about methodology, if you open your methodology, it doesn't only benefit your field because you're actually bringing more knowledge than just your research, but your entire research paradigm. You're also helping yourself. So that's something that anybody dotted with reason might understand at some point that if we share that, we will have comment on that, they will improve on that, and that. See, from the beginning, we were talking about open science, but that is just science. If we follow the scientific method, it's supposed to be a public service. It's something that's supposed to be shared. Knowledge is supposed to be universal, not proprietary. So what pains me is that we have to label something open science, but from the beginning, we're only talking about science practices. The point about open is just to get rid away from any kind of corporate institution that wants to make a profit out of it. And therefore, you miss your mission, which is technically a service public, uh, public service, which is to increase, no matter how small it is, you bring a brick to this universal wall, which is knowledge. What are the processes by which a paper or finding goes through before it is published? Ooh. You have five hours in front of you? <laughs> There's a, that's a long, long answer. 
as there's no proper answer. Mostly, uh, instead of what's going on, what are the processes by which a paper or finding goes through before it is published? Technically, technically, when you consider that your research is worth uh, being advertised, so the last bit of the scientific method, you published and you disseminate your result, it's supposed to go to an editor. The editor will then decide uh, if he wants to accept it or not, depending on if it falls under the, the umbrella of its journal, if it falls into the topic of the journal is in charge of. Then the editor will select uh, some reviewers that will work freely, that will be peers in your field, that will uh, freely, I mean, pay by taxpayer, but freely, uh, assess the quality of your data. Peer reviewed, it's supposed to be the stage where you check if a paper falls under the proper methodology of your specific field. If there's no flaw, if there's no fraud, if it's it was done properly, if it's not just half-baked claim. Problem is, uh, most of us here are associate editors in journals, and we see all the time people doing a two-line review don't put much effort into that because it's not something they paid for, because something that's something that they care about. So having something peer reviewed is an essential step. We don't have yet something better to check the quality of a paper, but it is far to be perfect. Therefore, when something is published, it doesn't mean that it meets the highest quality standard. It just means that a couple of people read it, assess it, consider it as to be correct, that falls onto the standards within one field, and then go under publication. What open publication claim or call for, it's the constant re-examination of published pieces. Science and knowledge is dynamic. It's something that evolves. All set of understanding, all beliefs, all conception keeps evolving with time, as long as our technology and our sense of measurement so we need to have our scientists access to those papers to actually be able to review them and not be set in stone. So that's what I meant by uh, trust science is an anti-science statement. So the process by which the paper goes, unfortunately, is not the best, but that's let's say that's the best we have so far. Yes. So this is where we come with open solutions to actually improve the transparency of this publication. Then you can see who are the reviewers, what was the comment, was the spot on, was something undermined or ignored, and then you can avoid the kind of uh, publication we had, for example, with the economic paper. And that you have plenty. But we have to consider what it is like to uh, generate data in a modern world what it is like to fight for academic position, to fight for tenures, to fight for grants. You need to publish, you need to, you are forced by your decision. It's literally a publish or perish, unfortunately. But that's another topic, and it's kind of global. So anyway, uh, everything is related to open sciences, and I hope that in the next talk, uh, you will get a better understanding about different aspect of open sciences and how you can apply that to, uh, to your own research. Thank you. Okay, I think we've had questions. So thank you all for being here. Thank you again, my team, for the talk and discussion. And Okay, we hope to see you next time. Yeah, be glad to be there. See you all soon. Thank you.